Hi, I'll keep the video short for today. We will be talking a little bit about the twin quiz in class. I'll answer any questions that you have about next week's negotiation exercise, and we'll talk a little bit about the cases that were assigned for reading as well as the problems. One note, there was a typo in the syllabus, so what is labeled as problem 20.16 in the syllabus for problems to talk about should actually be problem 21.6. And so problem 21.6 we'll be talking about in the context of specific performance. A lot of what you're seeing in the reading on non-monetary remedies is review. It's a review of material that we spoke about last semester in our introduction to remedies. But some broad categories to consider, some things to consider, generally is that by contract, people can contract around default doctrines, right? And so even though the default is that the court will award expectation damages, that monetary remedy that we talked about last chapter, um, parties can agree on other types of remedies. And so one of the ways that they do that is they set up an amount in advance that a reaching party will have to pay on the event of their breach. You could see that as um, essentially a buyout provision, but what the way that courts treat it is as what is called liquidated damages. Damages that are agreed upon in advance that a party will pay if they breach the contract. And, and generally speaking, liquidated damages need to be reasonable either in light of the anticipated losses or the actual losses. And courts vary upon which of those they put more weight on, anticipated losses or actual losses. And in the context of the Kent State coaching case that we'll talk about, we see that courts are often willing to be fairly flexible if they believe that the parties really were sophisticated parties that knew what they were getting into when they set out a particular liquidated damages provision in their contract. But the thing that you always will see the party who doesn't want to pay the liquidated damages arguing is that it's a penalty and that the amount of liquidated damages is not tied sufficiently to either anticipated or actual losses. The other um, type of damage, or I should say remedy, that parties can put forth in their contract is really a limitation on the remedy or exclusion of certain remedies. Uh, the most common ones that we see are provisions that seek to exclude consequential damages and provisions that limit the amount that a breaching party will have to pay if it's um, a service provider, for example, as we see in our burglar alarm case, to the amount that the non-breaching party was expecting to pay for the services. In sales of goods, we often see limitations of remedies cabining them to repair or replacement of the goods in question if the goods are defective. So those are common and often enforceable by courts. 
One type of damage that I didn't assign in the reading, but that you've probably heard about and I think is worth just bringing up here in this video, is the nature of punitive damages. We've mentioned many times throughout this course that typically courts do not want to award punitive damages, that the nature of remedies and damages in contract is more about monetary compensation based on what parties actually expected to receive under the contract. And it's not meant to punish right, the breaching party. Your book notes, and I encourage you to just glance over the section, that where you will see some courts awarding punitive damages to have a deterrent effect, and that's the idea is that by awarding punitive damages, they discourage this party and other parties from behaving so badly in the future, um, is in tort, right? Something that is a tortious action by a party that is also a breach of contract. So this is sort of conduct that is willful, wanton, reckless, seems to be designed perhaps to deliberately inflict harm on the non-breaching party. Those are the kinds of situations where courts will at least consider whether punitive damages might be appropriate, but it is the rare occasion where courts will favor punitive damages. Okay. The other types of damages we're going to talk about tomorrow are the ones that are really a review from last semester. It's specific performance. And remember, you have to prove to a court that monetary damages would be inadequate before you're going to get specific performance and restitution. And the restitutionary remedy is an interesting one because we've seen that earlier this semester when we were talking about parties being able to avoid the contract and rescind a contract. And we talked about the combination there of rescission and restitution, meaning that it's possible in some of these scenarios that if a party uh, is getting out of a contract, if they're avoiding the contract, then it's possible that even the alleged breaching party might get something back in restitution if the non-breaching party has received a benefit but wants to rescind the entire contract. Right, then that non-breaching party might have to give something back to the breaching party if they received something of value under the contract. So that's the basic contours of what we're going to be talking about in class tomorrow, is these notions of can parties create their own remedies contractually? Yes, they can. What are the limits on that going to be? And can parties find ways of limiting in advance what they owe each other in terms of money or in terms of performance under a contract, even if a party breaches? And the answer to that is also typically yes, subject to some limits like, for instance, um, the UCC saying that even though you can limit consequential damages, you can exclude consequential damages, you can't exclude consequential damages for personal injuries. In other words, if you sell a product that harms somebody, causes them personal injury, Right. then it's prima facie unconscionable to exclude consequential damages for that personal injury, which means in practice that 
Uh, some courts, when they see those provisions in a sales agreement, will say, well, this is prima facie unconscionable. We're striking the entire limitations of re remedies clause. Okay. Other courts won't go that far, but we've talked about the blue pencil power of the court when they are find an objectionable provision within a contract. They can uh, limit the operation of a clause. They can remove the entire clause entirely, or sometimes courts will even go so far as to say the entire contract is unenforceable. We've talked about that in the past. So connecting it to discussions from earlier this semester. So this will be, uh, this week we'll be wrapping up some of our notions of damages. On Thursday, we will talk about third party beneficiaries and I'll put a little video up about that later this week. So see you in class tomorrow.